All right, so welcome, Alex. Uh, so delighted to have you here. Um, you know, you are our first guest speaker for this class. So uh, I'm very excited to you know, speak with you. And just in terms of a quick introduction, I think what's most exciting to me is that you're currently a senior policy analyst at, uh, at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, but you are also Georgia State's graduate. So that's exciting. And then you're currently pursuing a PhD program. So um, I'm going to uh, ask you a couple of questions that our students submitted and also, you know, add on to those questions as we move ahead. But uh, welcome and um, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So um, Alex, maybe we can start with you telling us a little bit about you know, the work that you do, what's your role and what does your sort of day-to-day -day work look like? Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, I work at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute and I'm a senior policy analyst there. Uh, the GBPI, uh, which is a tough acronym to remember because the B and the P always get flipped. Um, so I have to enunciate, <laughs> uh, but it's essentially a think tank. It's a research shop that does uh, really great analysis on public policy proposals. Um, we're nonprofit, um, we're nonpartisan as well. So our analysis and our advocacy is not uh, Republican or Democrat, it's very fact-based. And uh, we cover a broad range of issues related to the overall prosperity of, of health. And our mission at DBPI is to improve e economic opportunity for all Georgians. Um, some of the areas that are covered under our work include healthcare policy, uh, K through 12 education, higher education. We started recently uh, doing work around the criminal justice system. Um, and we also do work around immigration reform. Uh, I myself am the senior policy analyst for economic mobility. So I oversee all of our work related to jobs, wages, uh, social, uh, social welfare benefits, public assistance programs like uh, food assistance and TANF and, and um, even unemployment insurance, which is a really big one right now. And then underneath all of that, kind of uh, the, the single thread that crosses through all of those program areas is the budget. It's taxes and uh, budget. <laughs> um, budget is in our name. So we have a big voice whenever it comes to analyzing the state budget proposal, um, tracking spending, the state spending uh, priorities throughout the budgetary process, which we're actually in the middle of right now during the legislative session. And then we, you know, call out areas within the budget that don't speak to, you know, actually improving folks' overall prosperity and wellness. So, you know, for example, if there are cuts to public health during a pandemic, we, you know, wave, wave red flags around that. Um, if there are cuts to education, um, you know, we want to make sure that there are none, that we're actually boosting investments in education so that we can have a stronger recovery. Um, and then in addition to that, we're looking at ways that our tax system, which is how we fund our budget, primarily through corporate and income, uh, personal income taxes, and even some sales taxes, uh, we're making sure that the taxes are fair, like we are advocating for a fair tax system to help fund state services. Um, and there are many ways that we overlook ways to make our tax system more fair. Um, so we are advocating and doing a lot of research around that uh, issue as well. So those are all the big bucket things that, that we do at DPI. That's, you know, in terms of the jobs and the economy, that's where I sit and, and um, do a lot of work. Um, I also have to note that in addition to the research, I've thrown the term advocacy out there a few times. What that looks like, it looks like direct advocacy on specific issues. Um, we have a team of lobbyists. We are registered lobbyists on our analyst team. So I, for example, speak directly to our legislators about specific pieces of legislation and uh, help them you know, see things through, or if it requires a more defensive approach, 
uh, stop it from happening. So um, those are just some of the, the ways that I characterize our work and my work um, at DBPI. That's fantastic. Thank you. That really sets the context. Yeah. So, um, so if you were to explain to a layperson what exactly is budgetary and uh, you know, economy policy, well, how would you define it in accessible terms? Yeah, so that is a, a great question um, and one that we wrestle with a lot because we want people, everybody to know, know that their budget, like a, a state budget specifically, and we focus a lot on state policy, um, but to know that a budget is uh, for the people. It's supposed to be a reflection of public priorities. And uh, the way that we spend money is, is something that's important to preserving things like our, the, the health of our communities, preserving the health of our education systems, um, pre preserving democracy, quite frankly. All of that is also wrapped into a budget. And from a state budget perspective, um, almost everything that we deal with in our lives is touched by the state spending priority. So for example, the largest line item in the state budget is K-12 education. So if you went to school uh, at any point and matriculated to school, through public schools in Georgia, then you've been touched by our state budget. Um, if you drive on our roadways, uh, on our interstate, our highways, our streets, then you've been touched by our state budget. Um, higher education, obviously, if you're at attending like Georgia State University, then the state budget plays a big role in how the institutions are supported, funded, um, et cetera. So the budget is supposed to be, in our view, a moral document. It's a reflection or a statement of values. And those values have to really, uh, you know, reflect um, in, in our, you know, and again, in our view, what prosperity looks like. And what that looks like is we're not taxing people into poverty or, you know, there's enough funding in the budget to make sure that schools and low income communities have all the resources that they need. Um, that there is enough uh, additional cash assistance out there to prevent people from losing their homes, not being able to pay rent or utilities. Um, making sure that our public health departments have enough resources to serve their communities. Um, so those are all the things that a state budget supports um, and that we fight to preserve and improve upon um, through a lot of our research and our advocacy. So um, a quick plug, we actually uh, publish an annual document called the Budget Primer. So if you are ever interested in how Georgia funds its state services, um, across the departments that I mentioned earlier, like education, uh, public health, uh, human services, if you're into social work and, and uh, public benefits, then that document provides a pretty high level overview of how we spend our money um, and where our revenue comes from, which is the money that we use to, to pay for, for these things, which is primarily, again, through the form of uh, taxation. Oh, that's great. And, you know, uh, in prior weeks, we've been talking about all the criteria that a policy analyst uses to construct policy alternatives. And so I think, you know, you framing it as an equity and moral endeavor very much aligns with some of the discussions we've been having. And, you know, we've sort of talked about also the political, um, you know, implications of policy alternatives. So I know you said you're sort of a uh, independent bipartisan entity, but you know, for you to take forward some of your ideas, do you take into consideration divergent contrasting view from both aisles? Like what does that process look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's no surprise, uh, we do operate in a political system. Um, one that is definitely influential on the, uh, the, the speed of which we can make certain changes happen. Um, you know, and we do take into account that, right? Like we have to recognize that some priorities that may be, you know, considered more progressive may be a little bit more slow in Georgia. It probably takes a lot more work, particularly around like the community education side to win folks on the opposite end of the spectrum and vice versa too, some policies maybe more fiscally conservative, and we may want to do a lot more work to win 
more progressive folks um, or to get them to buy into some proposals there. So it is definitely like tug of war. You have to go back and forth uh, a lot, but the number one most important thing um, that keeps our work relevant and uh, insightful and gives us trustworthiness on, among folks of both parties is that the work is rooted in data and facts. Um, Evidence-based policymaking is at the heart of what we do and at the heart of our research. And, um, you know, we get a lot of good positive feedback from folks um, because we stick to the numbers, because we stick to the data. Now that's not applied, you know, that warm feeling of, you know, getting good feedback from both sides of the aisle. It's not applied universally across all policy issues because some policy issues are, I think, more politically charged than others because of the electoral consequences and because of, you know, the way that uh, some folks campaign. So, for example, um, Medicaid expansion is one of the biggest policy debates that is um, has Georgians hands tied. Um, we have over 500,000 people who are currently uninsured and it's gotten a little bit worse during the pandemic. Um, and this specifically applies to health insurance. And it's because they fall in what's called the coverage gap. And uh, this was a program that was established under uh, President Barack Obama. And what we noticed was that more conservative states, particularly in the South, did not want to adopt or expand Medicaid. Um, although the financial, the fiscal uh, uh, benefits would be you know, monumental, We're talking about uh, covering all of those who fall within that gap, um, but also bringing in billions and billions of dollars into the state. Um, but what it would mean is that uh, more conservative governors would have to adopt a policy that was championed by a uh, more progressive administration. Um, and that's why you hear the term Obamacare versus the Affordable Care Act a lot. So discourse matters, the narrative matters, um, and it does tend to uh, stifle how long it takes to get certain policies uh, past. It's been over. It's been over a decade. We've been fighting for Medicaid expansion, um, but the politics have played a bigger role in creating a barrier and, and making it happen. So um, yeah. we are nonpartisan, but all that to say, elections do matter. Um, whenever it comes down to some policy issues. Well, what a great example. And you know, we are also this week discussing about uh, sort of facts versus opinion and, you know, rational versus political analysis. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing from you is that you have to straddle both, you know, so you yeah. have to establish <laughs> yourself as an independent data driven, but then you are faced with these political, uh, you know, um, dynamics that you have to navigate. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to jump into Alex uh, some of the questions that uh, mm, the students sent for you, okay. um, and uh, let's see how uh, our conversation unfolds from there. So uh, one of my students asks: To what extent are each of the three entities, government, nonprofit, and businesses, are important in economic and budgetary policy making? Is one entity more important than other, etc.? And if you could give an example. Yeah, that is a, a really good question. So um, this this trifecta: business, government, nonprofit. I think it's important to note that they all work together. Like it's part of the ecosystem. Um, what we believe is that at the center of that is is people, everyday people. So our concern is, you know, how well does government serve people? How well do businesses serve people and how well do the nonprofits serve people. Um, a lot of how much, how well a nonprofit serves people is based on how well the government does at funding services. Or um, a lot of the reason why a lot of nonprofits exist is because the government doesn't fund services adequately, right? That's you know, why a lot of poverty programs exist in the nonprofit community. Um, so I don't know if it's, uh, if I would say that one is more important than the other in that ecosystem, I will say that um, businesses definitely have become more of a priority, I think, in that ecosystem. 
Um, we do a lot in Georgia, especially just for example, to make sure that businesses are, you know, taken care of, you know, quite frankly, and from an economic and budgetary perspective, that's really important to take into account because we have um, to, you know, for example, uh, Georgia's been named the number one place to do business for over eight years in a row, but we fall at the bottom of the list when it comes to education. We have one of the highest uninsured rates in the nation. Uh, we have, you know, persistently uh, sluggish wage growth and uh, other things. And our budget, we spend less now uh, in 2021 than we did before the Great Recession in terms of public spending per resident. So these are not good indicators, um, but something has to be uh, considered, you know, there around the context of where the number one place to do business, but possibly one of the worst places to raise a family um, and, and just thrive. So that's something that we talk about often. Um, businesses in Georgia uh, enjoy over $9 billion in tax incentives, and they don't get any form of evaluation or formal review on a consistent basis. So a lot of those benefits or those tax incentives, um, that's $9 billion taken away from restoring our education funding. Like I mentioned earlier, revenue through taxation is how we pay for state services. So that's money that's taken out of public health, out of public, uh, other public services. Um, what we want to see is we wanna see businesses held accountable. Uh, we, sure, we can be the number one place to do business, um, but let's hold businesses accountable. Let's give those tax credits, those tax breaks, um, a, review, a review, a formal evaluation. Um, that's happened once recently uh, in the film industry. We actually had one of the first formal audits of our film tax credit program, which is an important tax credit program, but it was delivering millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to an industry that was shipping jobs outside of the state and not delivering benefits specifically here to, to Georgians. Um, so we're trying to take a closer look at that, um, but because of that dynamic that you know, businesses tend to be prioritized, um, we, have, we do see a direct fiscal impact um, when, in terms of lost revenue to corporate subsidies. So um, that's, that's one thing. I would say the state definitely puts business, I think, first. <laughs> uh, but in our view, it's people who should be in the center and then everything else can figure out how to support people, then that we'd be a lot better off. That's great. And what, also, uh, what it also helps me understand is that a policy issue such as this one is really a systems issue, right? So if business supports K through 12 education, if they support all these other things, in the long run, they'll get employees who'll yep. stay and right? So right. I think those uh, trade-offs look different in the long term. So that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so this other question is, um, because your area of research is extensive, how do you go about gathering data to support how families living in deep poverty are not getting adequate resources and basic necessities despite having the temporary assistance for needy families? Yeah. And I believe you have focused on this specific program from, you know, it looks like uh, on your website. So I guess that's where the question is coming from. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the programs that we've been paying a lot of close attention to recently. Um, because it's one that's specifically designed to help lift people out of poverty, uh, or at least it was designed that way. And um, I have a report that goes into the history of TANF, uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and explains how it's not delivering on that promise anymore. So we have some proposals out to help uh, make the case for restructuring and reforming the system for that program. Um, but in terms of doing the data analysis, we, there are a lot of sources out there, the census being the most, you know, uh, readily available source of data. Um, that is what we rely on frequently. However, what we're finding is that the lag in data from the census creates some challenges uh, whenever you want to have real-time estimates of poverty as a result of major events. So for example, in the last year, Four and a half million people have lost their job or had experienced some type of layoff in Georgia and have turned to unemployment insurance um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, out of that bunch, we have no way of knowing at this moment 
how many have fallen into poverty as a result of that because they've lost income. Uh, the census is uh, taking into account prior year uh, responses on a survey about poverty experience. So the last census that came out in October of 2020 only brought us poverty data up until 2019, fall of 2019. We won't know the true poverty picture as reported by the census until October of 2021. So we have to deal with some lagging indicators. Um, there are other institutions that provide some more real-time analysis doing um, some more sophisticated estimation of poverty. So for example, at Georgetown, they have an institute that does that. Um, and, and we do reference some of that because we you know, trust the researchers there. Um, but beyond the, the hard numbers, uh, for us, and this was really important for that piece that was referenced, it's about talking to people. So there's a quantitative element, but there's also a qualitative element too. The qualitative being, we need to hear your story. We need you to tell us what your experience was uh, trying to subsist through poverty on these programs, on these meager benefits, and how has the, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted you? Um, we want to know from you directly, uh, as a result of uh, the pandemic, have you been able to find employment? Um, were benefits accessible to you? So one way that we did that is we actually uh, do some internal surveying. Uh, we do you know, create our own surveys. Uh, sometimes we do also search for third parties to develop them. Um, but for this particular purpose, we uh, drafted our own survey instrument deployed it in the field with uh, and partnered with organizations that serve people uh, who are navigating poverty and uh, unemployment. And they helped us spread the word and, and share uh, the survey and get responses for us. So we have a data bank of stories, um, you know, not positive, but necessary stories to give us uh, more, more meat uh, to tell the story of why these programs need to be improved. And I feel like in this work, the qualitative stories are just as important, and in some cases, if not more, than having census data or you know hardcore quantitative um, statistics about people. So, um, so yeah, I hope that that answers. It does. It does. Um, and you know, personally, I'm very interested in impact of research and practice, and I'm just so intrigued by your answer. And so, I have to ask this follow-up question: yeah. What's an example of a change you've made you know, through your you know, research and uh, advocacy work that you find sort of you're proud of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like I said earlier, progress is slow in Georgia. <laughs> it's a long game. It's definitely a long game, but success comes in many forms. Um, I would say kind of the biggest, one of the biggest examples of success is through legislative change. That's big scale policy change. And that actually occurred for us recently um, in 2020. So there used to be a law in Georgia um, related to our child care program. There's a, there's a program called CAPS in Georgia that gives families a subsidy to help offset the really extremely high cost of child care. It's expensive to have child care. Um, and it's geared towards low income families. Well, prior to last year, if you were a student in college, you weren't eligible for childcare assistance. But there are a lot of student parents who are actually attending our institutions, our public colleges and universities. Um, and a lot of them more focused on their studies naturally, don't work full time and just can't afford the full cost of childcare. So we actually developed a, a brief that did go into the statistics of, you know, who are folks, who are student parents in Georgia? Uh, and then we began to talk to people. We held listening sessions uh, throughout the state of Georgia and brought together student parents to tell us about their difficulty affording childcare and trying to access uh, the program but not being eligible you know, for it because of the, the law, because of the restriction in the law. Uh, we actually collected those stories and included them in our brief, but we also ran, and this is another element of our work, ran a media campaign that also uh, illuminated those stories through newspaper articles and through other forms of uh, news media. That is a really important piece. I mean, you have to have a campaign built around these. It's not just the policy brief. 
um, it's also the, the, the media and making sure that they're talking about it too so we can build more public awareness around these issues. Um, but uh, we brought in the directly impacted individuals uh, to also speak and testify about their experiences in front of the legislature. And because we were able to do that and because we were able to make an economic case, because that's always important, um, the legislature and the agency responsible for administering the program uh, felt that it was time for a change and that they couldn't justify not making the, the rule work um, or making that rule um, the actual law. So uh, they changed it and that was a big win for us. Um, it's slow to, to implement, but that was a big win. Um, but it varies widely depending on the policy issue um, there are some things that won't move uh, if you bring in like the perspective of a directly impact, impacted person. Um, there are some things that will only move if you can make a, a exclusively economic case for something. Um, and that is the majority of the time. <laughs> but uh, there are some opportunities where there's a sweet spot where you can have both. Um, but it is definitely difficult to leverage, you know, research in a way that is impactful through our process. Um, something that I like to tell folks too uh, is that it's not as um, linear. The process isn't as, as linear as a lot of people think, you know, and it's really murky and messy, uh, the, the legislative process. And a lot of lawmakers, um, quite frankly, they're not the expert on the issues that they legislate on, right? Like they hear things from their constituents or they see things in the news and they may say, I wanna write a bill, I wanna change this policy, but they're not the expert. Um, they are, you know, more of the figurehead, but they they're the elected representative of their, of their constituents. And they may have their own passion and reason for being in the legislature, um, but people in the community who are researchers or who experience these issues themselves they are truly the experts um, and they need to be equipped to speak in support of or against specific measures. And that's where we come in. Like we are providing the data, the stories, all of that together so that people who are, uh, who care about these issues have basically an arsenal to speak in support or against them. Um, so it's really about, about education um, in, our, in our view, so. Yeah, well, that's very well said. I'm sure you're inspiring a lot of my students who will look at this video. I think it sounds so exciting to be able to do that kind of work. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, go to the next question. It says uh, that given that policy you work on is at the intersection of race and poverty, and the general makeup of the current Georgia legislature leans towards a pull yourself up by bootstraps mentality. What are some of the most effective ways you have found to communicate why your policies are needed and important and not handouts? And I think started sort of started talking about it a little bit in terms of the economic argument, but any uh, anything else to add to this question? Yeah. Um, that is the question of the, the day. Um, that is our current fight. I'm just going to be completely honest. That is what we are dealing with right now. Um, we have an initiative at GBPI uh, where I work with my communications colleagues to develop better messaging around the safety net. Because historically, the safety net has been envisioned as this just, you know, program full of handouts, giveaways to the poor. Um, and that is not something that is recent. That is the history of social spending in this country. Um, since the uh, Social Security Act in 1935 created, you know, a host of uh, programs that give cash to families in poverty, um, there's been an ongoing resentment towards people, primarily people of color and women who participate in these programs. Um, there is a lot of misconception around work and the type of labor that people do and what counts as labor um, that should make them eligible for public benefits or not. Um, so there's a very long and troubled history around the bootstrap mentality. Uh, I was actually reading a book this morning or I'm in the process of reading a book about reconstruction and uh, which was the period following uh, emancipation in, in the US. 
And during reconstruction, um, the Freedmen's Bureau was established to help those ha that had been freed from slavery establish, you know, work, get jobs and find, you know, farm labor, purchase land, purchase homes, all of those things. And what I what I learned in that was that, or what I'm what I'm taking away from that is that the Freedmen's Bureau put so much pressure on work in terms of wage labor, like hard labor, like skills development and all of those things. Whenever freed slaves, a lot of them wanted to own their own land, set up cooperatives and do all kinds of different things besides work for an employer, <laughs> which you know at that time and even today comes with a lot of exploitation, lack of wages, lack of paid leave and all those other things that we are um, still experiencing in 2021. So um, that, you know, the, the history of the bootstrap mentality can be traced way back to then. It is a uh, work in progress on how we combat that here. So we stick to the facts. Um, one of the things that I have started to do recently, which is more of an experiment, but also aligns with our values, is we talk about the racist history of some policy uh, that exists in Georgia. So almost every public policy related to social safety net spending, economic justice issues can be traced to a Jim Crow law or something that happened following Reconstruction. Um, it, with TANA, for example, that cash assistance program for families in deep poverty, there's this thing called the family cap. And the family cap uh, law says that if you are receiving assistance, if you have another child while you're receiving cash, we're not giving you any more cash. And that's based off of this presumption that back in the 50s, that women were having babies just for the purpose of ca collecting cash, of getting uh, welfare. And that was you know, pervasive in the 50s, but it got struck down by the federal government until the 1990s, whenever we experienced monumental welfare reform and it came back up again and then it became uh, enshrined in law. And now Georgia is one of 10 states remaining that has a family cap law on the book, on the books. And part of that reason is because lawmakers believe that nobody should be on welfare. If you're able-bodied, you should be working and because there are endless jobs available. And that's not true. Uh, there are not endless jobs available. The labor market is highly volatile, um, especially right now. And it's also uh, dealing, you're dealing with segregation and discrimination within the labor, labor market as well. Um, there's issues with the inequitable access to education and higher education and who has access to uh, skills for, to perform certain jobs. So um, the history of the bootstrap mentality is what we're leaning into now. Like we're trying to draw a clear line between the words that are shared today to the things that were said by white supremacists in the 1950s, or you know, members of the KKK who were also white supremacists, right? In the early part of the 20th century, um, just to show that a lot of that is historically tied to um, racist policy, racist attitudes. Um, so it's complicated, and I don't have like a clear answer on how we're um, if if we're overcoming it, because quite frankly. We're not. Like I said earlier, it is the, the biggest challenge that we have today. And changing um, part of my PhD research uh, is around discourse. I'm a Chris, critical discourse analyst. So I look at the way that words shape public policy. And what I find is that there is an undoubtedly a relationship between the way that words are used, weaponized, uh, to create some material effect. Um, in, in the policy world. And words like bootstrap and you need to work hard and able-bodied and all of that, that is absolutely baked into the way that we govern in this country and how we expect people in poverty to uh, navigate uh, out of poverty. So, so yeah, I have a lot to share on that. I could go on and on all day. <laughs> and I think I love how you're considering history in putting together some of these arguments because again going back to your point about data i think it's just so important uh, to call these things out right and um you're giving me so many sort of ideas around how to better think and better talk about these issues so so thank you for that 
Um, yeah, just if I can just say like I I I bombed history in college. <laughs> like I was not good at it. Um, it wasn't my favorite subject, but I'm finding it's you know way more important. You know we may come come back to this, but way more important for my career now than it may have been. You know than I could have imagined it would be. And a lot of that's because a lot of what we're dealing with today, uh, while it may have been refashioned in new words and new terms and other things, a lot of the policies and, and experiences and challenges that we're facing in that front, a lot of it's been done before or it's happened already. Um, so that's just something I like to, I have to constantly consider as well in this work. Yeah, and you know, if you, even the recent um, announcement about child tax credit, right? And the social media just sort of, you know, is using the words all over again, the way you, the words that you've just, you know, sort of talked about that have been reified in our, con, you know, discourse. So, um, yeah, just, just so important to unpack that. I'm so glad you're doing that in your work. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, I read that you do research on ways to reduce poverty and improve social services in order to help reduce the rate of poverty in our state and nation, what do you think needs to be addressed first when it comes to policy changes? Yeah, uh, similar to what we were just discussing, I think the narrative needs to change um, a lot. And, that, and like I said, there's a lot of work to do there. Um, people, a lot of people don't realize that poverty is still as big a problem now as it was you know, back in the 1990s, for example. Um, there are some folks who have been experiencing this pandemic, the economic recession of the pandemic, more as a depression, quite frankly. And um, it's in pockets all throughout the state of Georgia. Um, I grew up in the South, I've been born and raised here. I grew up in Alabama, I've lived in Mississippi, Louisiana, and I've been living in Georgia for about eight years. And poverty is persistent in all these places. Um, so I think, hey, you know, again, that narrative and like telling the story about how it still exists, um, the poverty rate in Georgia today, about 13%, and this is pre-pandemic actually, so 2019, is, it's the same as it was in 1996, whenever we were supposed to reform welfare as we know it, to help eradicate poverty, and we in fact, we haven't done, done that at all. So um, it's still a big problem. And we need more voices to expose that, to expose it as, as the problem as it is, because it hasn't gone away. Um, the counter discourse in that is that the unemployment rate is the lowest it's ever been, and that wages have increased you know, dramatically over the last decade or so. Uh, but that stuff is a distraction from the poverty numbers and that poverty story. So that can't be, um, can't be dismissed. Um, by by other dis distractions within the discourse. And then there's also, this is, you know, you ask for one or what comes first, but the other part of it um, is something that's great, gaining more traction in the economic policy world. Um, and again, it's not something that's new. It's been something that's been uh, discussed for, for decades now, especially since the half, first half of the 20th century. And it's just giving people cash. Like people just need money <laughs> like to, to live. And um, that is a policy statement that, you know, isn't so bold. Um, I believe, you know, what's interesting thinking about history, I mean, Richard Nixon, uh, with all of the drama that he experienced and the country did as a result of his administration, he actually championed a guaranteed income program. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also championed guaranteed income. Um, and now we have pilots of, you know, universal basic income or guaranteed income popping up all across the country in uh, California. We have uh, one in Mississippi, even in the Delta region, there's one in DC, um, and there's talk of one actually emerging here in, in the Atlanta area. Um, so it's let's change the narrative, but let's just give people cash, <laughs> give people money. <laughs> and I know that's like, you know, uh, so basic and sounds so simple, um, but I, I, I do firmly believe that people do make the best decisions for themselves and their families. And we just give people what they need to like a basic floor to live on, then uh, the country would be a lot better off and we could address those poverty issues 
uh, pretty substantially that way. And there is significant research that says cash is sort of the best option. So it's not just an ideological position, right? Yeah. 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 Well, the, and that goes back to the bootstrap mentality though, right? Because there's a lot of stigma around, well, if we give people cash and they're not going to work, um, they're not going to contribute. It's about, you know, we tie, you know, humanity to, to labor, to wage labor. Um, and that has to be uh, troubled, you know, more, I think, through the research and things like that. Um, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, the research is out there. It's backing it up. Um, so as a numbers guy, I'm definitely excited about all of that. Um, but that's one of the ways that I, it's not a silver bullet. I can never say it's a silver bullet, but that's one of the ways that I think we could at least begin to scratch the surface um, probably a lot more deeply. Very cool. So uh, the other, next question uh, is, as an economic and budgetary policy major, um, so my student's talking about himself, what advice can you give about an investment to make that can impact racial justice? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, your education <laughs> is probably going to be the most expensive investment that you make um, in understanding these issues. Um, I didn't really have a deep understanding of social issues related to race, uh, economic issues, um, and anything of that nature until I got to college. Um, I, you know, grew up, like I mentioned, in the South, and even as a person of color myself, uh, you know, you come up in education systems that don't allow for, like, critical analysis of the social world that you live in. Um, in many ways, it's discouraged, um, right? I think we can see that playing out now with uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones' 1619 piece and the reaction of you know, the world um, in schools that want to teach the history of race in this country and how the previous administration created a commission to criminalize educators who do want to tell the truth about the United States and, and our history. Um, so the single most important investment is that of education, both formal and informal. Um, I think there is a lot that we can learn from our organizing community, um, for those who do grassroots work in community education through uh, protests. Uh, I actually learned a great deal from folks in that space, um, not just the Black Lives Matter space, but also those who've organized in the US and in the South for, for many years since the civil rights era. Um, so becoming a student of, of that world is, I think, a big investment. And uh, what it looks like, it's not just a financial investment. It's, you know, of course, maybe some resources are needed, but it's a matter of just talking to people who led, you know, in those years, who led in those spaces um, and what they, what they used to, to triumph and, and overcome um, is a lot to, to think about. Uh, the, the other big investment, I think, is an investment in yourself <laughs> in racial justice work. Like, it's not, um, it's not happy work. <laughs> it's very uh, traumatic. And um, paying attention to your self-care and your mental health, um, especially whenever there are repeat in incidences of um, injustice, I think is, is really important. So um, those are three things that, that I would offer. Thank you. Yeah, and so much great organizing work happening in and around Atlanta mm -hmm. and in Georgia. So I resonate with that a lot, your response. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, uh, another question is, I understand that you have achieved a bachelor's, doctorate, and master's degree from some amazing programs, and you're now a senior policy analyst. Would you mind elaborating on how you were able to secure this job and what steps you had to accomplish in order to become a successful candidate for the position? Yeah, I think that's a great question because you know you're you are such a role model for some of our students. So yeah, any advice on sort of how did you navigate your career path? And yeah. actually, for, I would also love to learn what comes for you after your PhD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm a, a PhD candidate. So I'm, um, I'm waiting on getting my defense date from my chair any day now so I can wrap that up. Um, 
that has been a journey in itself. Um, but I've also worked full time while I've pursued it, um, which is a bit of a departure from the way a lot of folks get their, their PhD. Um, but to back up from there, uh, I grew interested in public policy whenever I was in college. Um, it actually happened around the time that Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman. So it was in 2012, I believe, when that happened. And um, I went to a college on a, a large university in Alabama, University of Alabama, and I was in the minority uh, as, a, as a black man. And a lot of organizing was actually happening in response to the killing of Trayvon Martin. And that was, again, what opened my eyes to injustice, not just interpersonally between one individual and another via racial slurs, or in that case, you know, uh, racial bias that resulted in murder and death, um, but also bigger issues, systemic and in, in institutional and structural issues. Um, so I switched my major from music education because I was <laughs> in music uh, and switched it to political science and uh, minored in African-American studies so I could get more of a sociological and political worldview of what was happening around me. So college afforded me a lot in that in that aspect. Um, and then when I graduated, I instantly uh, went to or joined Georgia State and joined the Andrew Young School there to get my master's in, in public administration. And in January, uh, at the time that I started the program, I also started the uh, an internship at Atlanta Public Schools. Not in as an instructor or as a teacher, but in their legislative uh, affairs office. I, was my first time given the opportunity to go to the Capitol, which is just a few steps away from the school district's headquarters and sit in on hearings and meet with lawmakers and take notes. And um, that to me, I think was what catapulted me into this position now. Knowing that, you know, this is not a job that's, you know, for the faint of heart. I think that experience back then definitely made me want to pursue a state level public policy role, be influential at, at the state policy level, um, because that's what that, that internship opportunity afforded to me. So um, I, I concluded that internship and then uh, went directly into another internship. I had two while I was at Georgia State. Uh, the second one was at the Southern Regional Education Board, which is a large uh, research institution and advocacy organization that's focused on education policy. Um, that was great work, but I didn't do as much in terms of the legislative stuff. It was just more data crunching, number crunching. And then um, when I concluded my time at Georgia State, I said to myself, wow, I really like research. Like I, I got to continue on. Um, but the best way that I conceptualized continuing on in research was by getting a PhD in the policy issues that I wanted to, to study. So I started that process and then realized after a year that I had been going to school from kindergarten all the way <laughs> up through my master's and then to the PhD. So I spent a year uh, getting my first year of my PhD under my belt, still doing ed policy research uh, and do researching. I was in Louisiana researching issues there, um, but then realized that I need to like take a little breather um, find work. Um, so I relocated back to Atlanta and found a job uh, working for uh, in philanthropy, where I got more exposure to how nonprofits work um, and how advocacy works at the grassroots level. And then I realized through that experience um, that I want to be back in the seat of doing research and advocacy um, on a full time basis. And at that time, I also restarted my PhD at Georgia State in the College of Ed. And um, the organization I work at now, GBPI, was also a grantee of the philanthropic organization that I worked for. So I was familiar, intimately familiar with the organization. And when the job opportunity presented itself to me, I jumped on it because I had just been a fan of the organization and its work, you know, and I felt like this was my chance. So I, I, I got in that way. Um, 
kind of unconventional to have that relationship prior to joining um, the team. Um, but I think I was definitely aided by a lot of the research um, experience. So for those that want to be policy analysts, having, you know, uh, quant skills is important. Um, it's not, you know, a, a, a a definite no in this work if you don't have it, but it's very important, especially if you're interested in budgets, um, understanding how public budgets work. I took public budgeting at Georgia State, when I'm glad I did. <laughs> um, understanding how uh, bureaucrats work too. Actually, one of my first courses at GSU was public service and democracy under now Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Bordeaux. Um, and that really opened my eyes to the way that state agencies work and the administrative policy process, which is a whole new world that we probably don't have time to get into today. Um, but those skills are really important. Uh, but fundamentally, being able to translate, um, not from one language to another, but being able to translate policy to just everyday people is probably the number one thing that policy analysts need to know how to do. Um, you know, whenever I'm hiring for somebody to work with me on my team, I want to know, can you take an issue about the tax code and convert it to something that everyday people can understand? And I feel like that is one of those big, you know, changes that we have to make in our work for those who do advocate. Um, because a lot of stuff, the reason why it doesn't get done uh, is because there's not enough public education about it. And it's the reason there's not a lot of public education about it is because the terms, the concepts that we use are not very friendly. <laughs> um, it's very academic work. And I don't want this work to be academic. I think we should invite everybody into it because it's a big part of the process to seeing big change. So um, those are three you know, things that you know, I lift up as like key skills to consider uh, if you wanna work at a think tank um, type organization, or even if you want to work in, in government itself, um, those are really important things to think about. That's great advice, Alex. Um, so the last question I have is that given the pervasiveness of many of your study topics, how do you balance the need for pol policy action with comprehensive and accurate research? Yeah. I'm thinking policy action means like the actual advocacy uh, on an issue. Um, it's all about planning. <laughs> There's only so much that that you can do in a, in a given year. And a lot of what we do is determined by the way that the legislature works. So for example, um, legislative sessions uh, come in uh, twos in Georgia. We have two year sessions uh, broken into 40, uh, two sessions that are 40 days and 40 nights, uh, not consecutive. So right now we're in our legislative session, uh, the start of a new two year legislative session. And it'll, it started in January and it'll end around the end of March or April. And then we'll take a break. And then next January, we'll start again for another 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, during those session days, it's hectic. And there's not a lot of time to do a lot of research. It's more about actually doing the action. It's about engaging your communities, your partners, uh, telling them to write their lawmakers or send an email or call, uh, tell them to vote no on, on House Bill uh, XYZ. That's what session is, is really about. I mean, it happens so fast. So the research stuff has to happen really outside of session. Um, during those months where there's not a, a house floor meeting or debate or a committee meeting every day. Um, it, is, it is, you know, also a time where advocacy happens too. Outside of session, you're also, you know, especially when it comes to the budget, which is a year round process, finding ways to talk to lawmakers, um, but you're also balancing the research. So I would say it's, you know, dictated by the issues, um, uh, priorities, policy priorities, also inform the type of research we do, the written products that we produce. Um, so for example, we have a policy agenda that was developed based off of listening sessions that we've done all across the state. And that policy priority or that policy agenda is also what sets our research agenda. So if there's research to be done, 
um, it's usually done in service of or in support of the policy priorities that we know that we're going to focus on. Um, so that's that's how that works um, for us. Um, I will not lie, there are things that come up that are super exciting and super intriguing that I want to jump on and want to do research on, but I can't because it's so outside the scope of uh, what needs to get done right now, but I do plan for it um, in the future or put it, you know, I post it uh, somewhere saying, hey, let's revisit this in 2021 or, or 2022. Um, and I, I do want to be transparent too. Um, we're a nonprofit. So funders, we, that means we receive uh, funding from individual donors, as well as big philanthropic foundations like uh, the um, any Casey Foundation or uh, the uh, I'm trying to think of our funders, the Candida Fund, who was in Atlanta, a local Atlanta foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, which is a big one. And sometimes they approach us and say, hey, can you commission a report, a study uh, for us? And we'll say yes sometimes. Um, so that's also included in our in our work plan as well. Well, that's fantastic. I know we've sort of run out of time, Alex, but is before I let you go, is there anything else you would want to say that we didn't talk about and my students didn't ask? I, you know, say get involved. Um, if this is work that is marginally interesting to you, it's easy to get involved in the process, easy, mostly by way of just opening yourself up to, to learning about it, to listening. Um, like I said, we're in the middle of legislative session right now. If you go to legis.ga.gov, which is the legislators, legislature's website, you can follow the, the floor debate. You can search for bills that might be related to issues you all are studying. Um, I know a lot of students who develop like a, a practicum or a, a thesis paper based off of legislation that they're watching in real time move through the legislature. Um, it's, it's a good time to just be involved and then follow us at GBPI. I mean, we put out a lot of research and a lot of opportunities to engage as, uh, as students um, or as individuals, however you want to engage. Um, so use all those resources. Um, you know, I, I like to remind folks that the elections are important to get the people there, but it's the public policy that holds them accountable. So um, this is a big part of the, we lose a lot of people after the elections are done. <laughs> and I have to run after them and say, no, 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 don't leave. Like we're, we have a legislative session coming up and like $2 billion in budget cuts are on the table. We need you to, to stick around and advocate um, with us in, in, on these issues. So that, and then the, the last thing I'll say is that Georgia State University, the Andrew Young School was a big benefit to my journey and definitely helped me um, on my pathway uh, to get me here. I'm a huge fan. And um, I, I always say, you know, in a bragging way that I attended the Andrew Young School. So all your students are very fortunate uh, to be to be at the, at the school and in this course, which um, I know that I would have loved to uh, take whenever I was at GSU. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And I am leaving this conversation so inspired. I think, uh, you know, especially listening to your experience and your work, I'm sure uh, my students will take a lot away from this. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. And thank you for doing what you do. Sure thing. Thank you. All right.